the overall function of reticular formation is modulatory and premotor, controlling activities of uh, somatic motor activities, uh, cardiac control, habituation, modulation of pain. So now going to uh, an, a better understanding of the reticular formation. What is this reticular formation? So the objective of uh, the session would be the structure, connections and functions of the reticular formation along with the reticular activating system, the reticular ascending system and the retic reticular descending system would be done. So basically the reticular formation, it has got, I've told you, has modulatory function. It is basically a diffused mass of deeply placed and poorly defined group of cells. The definition of these cells is not very defined and they are basically defined. Since the areas are not def uh, defined well, you can call them as it is a diffused mass of deeply placed cells. And they, what is their extent? It extends from the upper cervical segment of the spinal cord passing through the medulla, pons and the midbrain to the thalamus actually makes up the reticular formation. So cells, diffused deep cells without a proper definition. And you can see there are three columns which makes up the reticular formation. The midline raphe nuclei, the midline nuclear group or the medial nuclear group and the lateral nuclear group. So here you have it there, the, uh, the reticular formation, the extent. You can see the cerebellum, the brainstem, and the cerebral cortex. So here is a distribution. Can you see here the, the refused group of deep cells? Here you have the lateral nuclear group here where you have very small cells. And then you have here the medial group of diffuse cells where it is larger cells. And then you have here the purple uh, color one which is called as the raphe nucleus which actually makes the so reticular formation. <clears throat> Now reticular formation, it is basically uh, a network of loosely arranged neurons and it is distributed throughout the brainstem where there are no neural tracts or the nuclei present. See that's a point which you need to have an understanding where there are no neural tracts and nuclei present. Now you have the parvacellular, these parvacellular gigantocellular neurons are all uh, neurons or cells which are present in the reticular formation. So the parvocellular neurons receives inputs from all the special senses. So it helps in the arousal mechanism of a person. You have the gigantocellular neurons which relieve the major inputs from the spinal cord. And then you have pain. Pain, you can see that there is a strong influence of pain on the reticular activating system by the collaterals it gives to periaqueductal gray of the midbrain. That's why we tell us pain modulation is an important function of the reticular formation. So you can see all this uh, divisions here, the mesencephalic reticular formation, the parvocellular reticular formation, the magnocellular reticular formation, the raphe nucleus here, the blue colored one, the gigantocellular reticular formation, the central reticular formation here, the brown colored one, the lateral reticular formation, the, the green color one, and you have the paramedian reticular nucleus here. So basically you look at this, you get an idea that reticular formation is a, a, a diffused mass of cells where, see this figure, you can see them at least defined, but in real, these uh, diffused mass of cells are not very defined which actually forms the reticular formation. Now the inputs to the reticular formation if you see arise from different higher center. That means the efferent fibers are reaching the reticular formation from different higher centers. Which are the higher centers from which reticular formation is receiving impulses? It receives inputs from cerebellum, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, amygdala and also cerebral cortex, the premotor cortex. So from these five higher centers, the reticular formation is receiving its inputs from. Now uh, the spinal cord, so that's about the major part. Now we come down, spinal cord also sends its input to the reticular formation. Now what is that pathway called as the spino reticular tract and the collaterals goes to reticular formation from all the ascending tracts. Ascending tracts, when it's ascending up 
or it is going up in the spinal cord, collaterals are sent to the reticular formation and also specifically the spinoreticular tract. So that's how it's through the spinoreticular tract and the collaterals given from the ascending tracts, the spinal cord is getting connected to the reticular formation. Then you have the brain stem being connected to the reticular formation through cranial nerves, the tectum which includes the superior and the inferior colliculi and how is that connection? We call it as the tecto reticular visual and the auditory impulses. All this is being delivered uh, through the tectum, from the tectum to the reticular formation. Now cerebellum is sending impulse to the reticular formation through the cerebellar reticular tract. Basal ganglia also sends its inputs to the reticular formation. Neocortex through corticulo reticular fibers, which are both motor and sensory, it's also sending. Then you can see fibers coming from, these are all, see what is put in brackets is these are all parts of the neocortex from where uh, the reticular formation is receiving its impulse from and limbic system also gives inputs to the reticular formation from the amygdaloid and the hippocampus complex of the limbic system. Now coming to the efferent connections of the reticular formation, you can see that from this arrow, you can make out that all these uh, in, from all these centers like you know the gustatory cortex, the olfa, the tongue, the brain stem, cerebellum, from all of these places you we need to understand that the reticular formation is receiving its efferents from. Now you can see that let's just put it in a more systematic organized way. You can see that the efferent fibers going to the brain from where from the olfactory, optic, auditory, gustatory, touch, pain, temperature, proprioceptors, visceral and the internal structures of the body are all connected to the reticular formation. That means all these fibers from here which are going to the brain is going to be all connected with the reticular formation. So you have it all here. You can see the pink colored one reticular formation and the efferent fibers. So the fibers, all those from those centers the fibers when they go uh, go to the cerebral cortex you can see it giving fibers to the reticular formation now coming to the efferent connections reticular formation sends efferent fibers to spinal cord now in what are the forms it is sending we have just named it as descending reticulospinal tract so descending reticulospinal tract where you had the medial reticulospinal tract and the lateral reticulospinal tract is an important efferent connection of the reticular formation with the spinal cord. Now in the reticulospinal tract, you know that the medial reticulospinal tract is inhibitory and the lateral reticulospinal tract is facilitatory and it's actually connect the reticular formation with the anterior horn cells and also the gamma motor neurons. Now it is connected to the lateral horn cells also and the cells of origin of the sympathetic nervous system is actually from here. Now it sends efferent fibers to the brain stem, to the cerebellum, to the red nucleus, substantia nigra and tectum in the midbrain. It sends fibers to thalamus, subthalamic nuclei and also the hypothalamus. It sends fibers to corpus triatum, neocortex and the limbic lobe indirectly through thalamus and the hypothalamus. So these are the efferent connections of reticular formation and uh, let's go see the reticulospinal tract has been already done when we did tracks in detail but for a better understanding of the reticular formation I'm just going to revise the reticulospinal tract. Now the reticulospinal tract it's the main extra pyramidal motor pathway to the spinal cord and the reticular formation of the pons and the medulla it diffuses uh, it profusely to the uh, spinal cord from the reticular formation. It has got an autonomic, uh, autonomic control where the drive is from the sympathetic preganglionic fibers and it uh, see basically these two are uh, these three are actually the functions of the reticulospinal tract. Let me make have a get you a clarity on that. So the functions of reticulospinal tract if you look at the autonomic control drive to respiration and maintaining the uh, tone of the postural muscles. Now autonomic control it is exerting it's a drive through the sympathetic preganglionic fibers and respiration drives maintained through the phrenic nerve and finally the 
tone of the postural muscles are also maintained by the reticulospinal tract. Now the reticulospinal tract has got two major divisions. You have the medullary reticulospinal tract and the pontine reticulospinal tract. Now the medullary reticulospinal tract, if you see, it descends in the anterior lateral column of the spinal cord. And what does it function? It inhibits the extensor muscle and it facilitates the flexor motor neurons. So this function of the medullary reticulospinal tract, you need to have it at the tip of your tongue. Now you have the pontine reticulospinal tract where, how, what is the descent? How is the tract descending down? It descends medially to facilitate the A gamma, the A alpha motor neurons of the limbs and it inhibits the flexor muscles. Now, uh, uh, the it, it basically the tract it receives very strong efferent impulse and the descending cortical inputs actually this tract is carrying excitatory cortical, cortical input predominates in the medullary nuclei so that's you know a little little information about the two divisions of the reticulospinal tract the medullary reticulospinal tract and the pontine reticulospinal tract now, coming to the reticular activating system. What is this reticular activating system? See, the ascending fibers from the reticular formation is the ascending reticular system. And it's an ascending reticular system, what we call as the reticular activating system. So, the fibers which essence in the reticular formation, we call it as the ascending reticular formation or the reticular activating system and the fibers which descends from the reticular formation, we call it as the descending reticular formation. So, this reticular activating system, you should understand it is receiving collaterals from specific ascending pathways and the most of the ascending pathways of the reticular activating system, you can see it relaying to the midline and the intralaminae nuclei of the thalamus. That means it, is, it has got very strong connections with the uh, thalamus. Now, there is, it's diffuse in various parts of the cerebral cortex and some of the, uh, the neurons or the pathways, you can see it is bypassing the thalamus. And this reticular activating system, uh, if you look at, there is an interesting thing to be kept in mind. It is actually not involved in any modality specific sensation. And the function of the reticular activating system, if you try to sum it up from all this is, it diffusely stimulates the cerebral cortex and it is responsible for the consciousness and alertness of a person, which we call it as arousal. So this is basically the minimum things you need to know about the reticular activating system, which which is actually the ascending fibers which are going from the reticular formation. Now we have the descending reticular system. The descending fibers are arising from the reticular formation and this is basically happening from two large areas of the brain stem. You have the upper area and the lower area. Upper area you can see is spread over the pons and the midbrain and that upper area please keep in mind it is actually facilitatory and the lower medullary area, lower areas inhibitory. There, there shouldn't be any confusion there. The upper area of this descending reticular formation is facilitatory and the lower part of the descending reticular formation is always inhibitory and basically the, the descending reticular formation is concerned with the regulation of the stretch reflex and the descending fibers come from the raphe, magne, magna, uh, magnus and also the PAG is, is getting inhibited. The substantia gelatinosa of Rolando and all this connection is happening to regulate the pain transmission. See PAG is nothing but periaqueductal gray. So the descending fibers which are actually coming from the raphe nucleus and the periaqueductal day. What is it doing? So uh, I think there should be a gap put here. So the, fi the descending fibers coming from these two places is inhibiting substantia gelatinosa of Rolando. So now because of this inhibition, see because this is happening and because of that the substantia gelatinosa is getting inhibited, what is happening? There is regulation of 
pain transmission being happening here. So how is the reticular formation able to modulate pain or regulate pain is by actually this is the point you need to have in mind. The descending fibers from the raphe magnus and the periaqueductal gray inhibiting the substantia gelatinosa of Rolando is that main connection where reticular formation is able to modulate pain. Now coming to the functions of reticular formation, first let's discuss the control of motor activities. Reticular formation, you know, through the reticulospinal tract is regulating the posture. Motor cortex, basal ganglia and the cerebellum control posture by influencing the activity of the reticulospinal tract. Now pontine reticulospinal tract, it facilitates the spinal stretch reflexes. It's excite, uh, exciting extensor group of muscles which are the anti-gravity muscles. Now the medullary reticulospinal tract inhibits the spinal motor neuron activity which is innervating the extensor group of muscles. So basically the control of motor activity I have really briefed up in this slide because the reticulospinal tract we have in detail discussed when we were discussing the motor tracts. So this is just, I've just picked up and put the most important ones. So, but uh, for whomever who hasn't really understood the reticulospinal tract, you need to go back and see our discussion on the motor tracts or the descending tracts. Now coming to the second function, it's over about the control of the sensory activities. Now the ascending sensory pathways actually sense collaterals to the reticular formation. So what happens when a sensory stimulus is applied? There is a conscious perception of sensation which is happening, which is actually going to activate the reticular activating system. So whenever I make a reference of reticular activating system, I'm talking about the ascending fibers of the reticular formation where individual is aware of the nature and all the other aspect of a sensation which, the, which you are exposed to. Now pain sensation if you see it increases the alertness of a sensation. So there is a simultaneous activation of the endogenous analgesia system also is happening along with the activation by of the reticular formation. Function number three the control of visceral functions is through the hypothalamus reticular formation both of them, hypothalamus also, along with reticular formation, you can see is controlling the functions of your visceral organs, vomiting and swallowing reflexes is under the control of the medullary reticular formation. Coming to the fourth function, sleep and wakefulness, fibers which are projecting from the reticular formation to the cerebral cortex via what? Via non-specific thalamic nuclei is actually making a person to remain in a state of wakefulness and whenever there is a decreased activity of the reticular activating system, you know that sleep is induced. And whenever there is a damage of the reticular activity system, uh, act reticular activating system, the person goes into a state of coma. Now, let's see the effect of drugs on the uh, reticular formation. So basically, the sedatives and the hypnotics, if you see, they actually prevent synaptic transmission in the reticular activating system to produce these effects. For example, there is increased reticular activity in under the effect of epinephrine, norepinephrine, amphetamine and acetylcholine and decreased reticular activity happens with general anesthesia. Now, coming to the summary of reticular formation, reticular formation in the brainstem, if you see, it is an integrator of vast and varied information which is being transferred to the brain or which is being delivered or which is the other from the output from the brain. Now, due to this diverse polysynaptic connections and the distinct functions of reticular formation. Now, reticular formation, there is both the ascending system and the descending system and the reticular formation is very much essential for the arousal and the sleep of a person. So, that's with or about the reticular formation. This was actually a diffused mass of cell groups which were not clearly defined. We went through the different nuclear groups uh, of the reticular formation. We went through in detail the efferent and the efferent connections of reticular formation and also the uh, functions of reticular formation was discussed in around seven to eight points.